Hi, I'm Andre, and I'm making an uncollapsible paraglider. So, the whole point about paragliders is that they collapse, right? So that you can put them in your bag, so you can take them places. Well, the bad thing about paragliders is that they're colla they collapse <laughs> when you don't want them to, and then you die. So, this is a project I've been working on for quite a few months, on and off, uh, and instead of doing one big video about it, I'll just do smaller videos as I discover more and more things, because I'm not really sure if this is going to work or not. So in this part one, let's look at some of the principles behind how a paraglider works, and some of the assumptions and ideas that I've made to go ahead with this project. Okay, so let's look at how a paraglider works. Uh, like most aircraft, there's an airfoil that, when exposed to an airflow, creates lift. And you would be down here, and you connect to the airfoil with some lines. Now, the beauty of the paraglider is that the airfoil is made of fabric, so it's flexible. You can have an aircraft that carries your own weight, but it only weighs maybe a fifth or a tenth of your own weight. If, so if the airfoil is made out of fabric, how does it keep its shape? Well, one, when it's exposed to an airflow, um, I didn't make it on the model, but there's a small cell opening here, which means this whole wall all around is made of fabric, and there's an opening, and there's a void inside. So the air comes in here and pressurizes this hole inside, which means it keeps its shape. The problem, the problem with these is even with shark nose technology here on the leading edge, there's only a certain range of angles that it will work and it will keep pressurized. So that means that we have a certain window of airflow direction in which the paraglider can operate and if we go too far one way, we have a stall. If we go too far the other way, we have a collapse. Okay, so what's interesting to me in trying to make an uncollapsible paraglider is what happens when we are here. So let's look at an example situation in which we could have airflow coming from the top. Okay, so let's look at that scenario where we have some kind of obstruction to the airflow. And over here we have that classic rotor area. If we look at this zone here in more detail, what we might find is that for that parcel of air, there is air that is going round and round. Which means that if you were flying your paraglider over here, the air will be pushing you down. And if you were flying the paraglider over here, the air will be pushing you up. And obviously there's a whole load, a different scale to this, where the turbulence can be, can be the size of your paraglider or much bigger or much smaller. Okay, so coming back to our model here, um, in the paragliding industry, these different sets of lines that connect to the airfoil along the cord have different names. These are usually called the A's, B's, C's, some wings have D's, and then you have your brakes. So as a pilot, usually you have these three fixed and you have control over the brakes. So when you pull on the brakes, it deforms the trailing edge down, and then if you release the brakes, the air pressure pushes it back to the original trim position. So if we find ourselves in some turbulence for whatever reason, it might mean that at some point we have air coming from that. And that will not sustain internal pressure and will push on, on that area of the paraglider and you might have a collapse, something like that. So the A line goes slack and the other ones remain. So the difference between a good pilot and a not so good pilot is how they react in a situation like this. 
For instance, a not so good pilot might take a long time to realize that the leading edge is deforming and coming in. And when he realizes that, he might apply way too much brake to overcompensate, which means he might end up in a very difficult situation in which controlling the glider is very difficult and you lose a lot of altitude at once. What a good pilot would do would be to sense that deflection coming in as soon as possible and apply some brake. Not too much, but just enough to pump it out and release the brakes as soon as possible, going back into controlled flight. So the sooner you realize what's happening, the less input you have to put in. So if you look at the problem of keeping the wing open in turbulent air, you realize that first you got a sense that the wing is deformed. Second, you've got to compute what is going on. So you have to make sense of the situation, what is happening, so you can determine how to correct. In this case, pulling the brakes just enough to keep the wing open and then release as soon as you can. So the quicker you can sense, the quicker you can compute and the quicker you compute, the quicker you can correct. So the quicker you do these two, the less of this you have to do. And there is a point at which if you take too long to do this and this, it's very hard to do this. If say you're a 60 kilo pilot, let's imagine you have 20 kilos, 20 kilos, 20 kilos on each of those lines. For this piece of fabric on the leading edge to actually deform, this line has gone to zero. It has to, gone, it has to have gone to zero kilos, otherwise that wouldn't move. So what, what, a, what an experienced pilot might notice is even before it deforms or as it just starts to deform, they sense it through this line on their harness or on their risers that something has changed and, might, and makes them correct for it instantly. So it might not even be an issue. So if you look at the actual tasks that the, the pilot has to do, they're not necessarily tasks that a human is very good at. We're quite slow. Uh, it might take us anywhere between 0.1 of a second to half a second or even a second to send something and same again to compute and same again to correct. So you could have something like a full two seconds or three seconds for all of this to happen. So Luckily for us, what is very good at sensing, computing, and correcting very fast is a computer. What I'm proposing is that if we could measure the tension on these lines, we could anticipate a collapse before it even happens. Because for that portion of the wing to collapse, this has to have gone to zero. And nothing goes from 20 to zero without going through everything in between. It might be very fast, but it definitely has, this, the tension on this line definitely has to go 20, 15, 10, 5, zero. So if you're monitoring the tension on this line within an electronic device, and you can see it going from 20 to 15 to 10 to five extremely quickly, you know it's not gonna have time to recover and it is going to collapse. So at that point, you should be already compensating with the brakes. But obviously, if all of this takes place in about 0.1 of a second, a human has no chance. But it doesn't mean that we can't do it with electronics. So in attempting to create the uncollapsible paraglider, the first step is to sense. Being able to know at all times with a very high refresh rate, what is going on with the tension on all of the lines. Okay, so I sense that a lot of you might have some questions and even thinking, you know, if you had a paraglider that basically flew itself and was impossible to collapse, would you even want such a thing? Would that take all the joy out of, um, out of paragliding? 
Okay, so if we look back at those categories, how I'm going to try to develop this is to start with this, and once we have a good way to measure the tension on the lines, then we can start to classify a wing and understand how it works so that we can predict things. And then from that, we can use our predictions to correct. So I'll just put down some of the applications. So if we do all of those things, all the way down here, the absolutely ultimate thing to come out of it would be the self-flying paraglider. It never collapses, it knows where it is, it has sensors on all of the lines and can actuate all, of, it can pull tension on all of the lines, not just the brakes. So it would be for paragliding what an ECU or ABS is for a car, you know, it controls everything about the engine. Uh, and the wheels and etc and knows everything that's going on so that's very far away and we might not even want to fly something like this you know if we're very new and we want to stay safe but actually it might be too complex too bulky too expensive whatever it might be but it doesn't mean that there's a whole load of other things that can come out of it so if we start to sense even if we don't do all of these other things if we start to be able to measure exactly uh, what's going on in the wing, we can start designing better paragliders because we understand better what is going on. And we can characterize we can characterize wings better. For instance, we can uh, make we can make EN testing of wings, for instance, by the way, that the lines react to inputs rather than by pilot feel and etc. Once we understand those things and what is happening to a wing and we characterize it based on tension on lines, uh, then we can start to compute such as understanding what is the optimum distribution of weight between A's, B's and C's, not only along the cord but also along the span of the wing because a wing is, you know, is 3D. So it will have A's there and then B's and then C's. So what is the distribution not only that way but also that way? Um, so in computing we can start looking to optimize how a paraglider flies. But also, um, if you think about your Vario, your Vario is basically sensing something that humans are very bad at. So fine barometric pressure differences, humans are very bad at that. So the Vario does that for, for you and it tells you if you're going up or down, which means you can grow cross, cross country, otherwise it'd be very difficult. So for this, for instance, you could have a collapse alarm where it doesn't do the correction for you, but it might warn you if it thinks it's about to deflate. So that is something that comes from just analyzing the data that comes from sensing it. And obviously, in correcting, you could have uh, servos on the brakes or on all of the lines, and you can dynamically control the paraglider so that you could have, get that, so that you could have the uh, you could have the paraglider go through very turbulent air, but you wouldn't know. Just like you could have a car going off over a very bumpy road, but if it has adaptive steering that knows exactly what is coming up ahead, it could raise and lower the wheels in a way that the car stays stationary in height although the road is very bumpy so by changing the length of each line individually you could do exactly the same thing so that's the basic introduction of what i'm trying to do uh, i'm not really sure how often these videos are going to come out or what the quality of them is going to be but it's definitely not going to be one after the other it, it might take six months a year so it's something that i do as I go. Also I'm going to Portugal over Christmas and that's coming up pretty soon so I'm not sure how many videos I'm going to be able to put out because you know family and all that. Alright so that's it thank you very much for watching don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already so you can 
uh, get notifications for when new videos come out and I'll see you very soon. Bye.